listening to the Unbreak Parents Podcast, episode 033. You're seen to chat about life, family, and of course, Humphreys McGee. I'm your host, Sarah Jehemiak, writer, journalist, author, first solo female podcast host in the jam music scene, mom of three, wife, and total Unbreak. Are you prepared for what comes next? Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me for episode 33 of the show. This episode will be all about the amazing shit that went down over the New Year's Eve Atlanta run. I'm so, so excited to bring this episode to you. It's been quite a project to listen back to all this and do this, but I'm so excited to finally have the finished product for all of you to hear. Um, I know that it's been a couple of weeks since the run, but the show was on vacation and, you know, coming back and having to mom right away. My kids, we got back super early, super, super early Wednesday morning and my kids had to go back to school Wednesday. So we got back into town and it was, you know, right back into it. And then, of course, we had to talk about holidays and the Brennan and Jake show last week. So here is the New Year's recap show, but I promise that it will totally be worth it. And I'm sure, as you know, by this point, Umphreys was seriously on the entire weekend, every single night of the show. I was just completely blown away by what I had just witnessed absolutely out of this world, exceeded and completely blew away any expectation I may have had. Although I have learned, thanks to Joel, that it's best to go into a show very open-minded. And I mean, this just, just, it was amazing. My love for this band was cemented so many times during the weekend. I mean, as if I needed that anyway, but I mean, definitely was just like, Oh my God. (laughs) All of the people that my husband and I encountered over the weekend were so nice. Um, You know, even the people that were not there for the show, people that lived in Atlanta, you know, everybody was just so nice. My husband and I had some seriously amazing food. We went to the aquarium too um, Friday during the day, and that was absolutely insane. I've never been to an aquarium like that before. Uh, there are just so many fish and things and it was insane. And if you are ever in Atlanta and you have never uh, been there, I highly suggest you go because that place was really freaking cool. Totally, totally worth it. And it was very packed, but totally worth it. (laughs) Um, I know that, you know, Atlanta was just such an amazing city too. Like it was very easy to get around. You know, we've been to multiple other cities um, for Umphrey shows, and Atlanta is very easy to get around, and like I said, it just, it, it really exceeded my expectations from the city, too. I had no idea really kind of what to expect, um, but it was just a wonderful city, and we will most certainly be back the next time Umphrey's is in town. There's so much more that we didn't have a chance to check out that. We want to. And the Tabby is a wonderful venue inside and out. Amazing sound. They just recently got a new sound system in. Great bathroom situation. And again, everybody was super nice. And it was super easy to get out of there at the end of the evening. Um, and our hotel was just a quick walk. So it was not hard to move around at all. Very awesome. Besides it being hot as balls on New Year's Eve seriously so fucking hot in that place like I've never been that hot in a venue before and I was wearing like a a dress you know so there wasn't a lot to my outfit like I wasn't wearing pants and a shirt and stuff and I was still hot so I can only imagine how you guys were feeling like even down on the GA floor like I can only imagine (laughs) um but again there were like that place was sold out I think that the uh capacity is It's 2,600, I believe. And, you know, so everybody's in there and just the energy and everything. So, of course, it was going to be hot as balls. But other than that, I do not have a complaint about the tabby. And, you know, before I forget, I do want to totally shout out the entire crew that 
works behind the scenes to make these runs happen. And, you know, you guys are working hard while we're raging out, you know, even behind the scenes. And again, this crew that works for Umphreys is just absolutely amazing. And, you know, they deserve so many kudos. Uh, Chris Mitchell, of course, it sounded amazing the entire weekend. Waffle, I mean, come on, he just seriously, just (laughs) well done that entire weekend for sure. And I'm sure that the Tabby is a wonderful venue to work in, you know, to light up and everything. And, you know, the special effects of the weekend, the snow coming down, um, the smoke machines. I mean, it was, it was quite a thing. Um, and if you did not know all the photographs that came in, um, from the weekend to just absolutely beautiful, Dave Levine, Tara Gracer, Chad Smith was there, I believe toward the end of the run and up and coming photographer, Adam Johnson, all of you did an amazing job capturing this weekend. Um, I know I've shared a couple um, on my Twitter, and I will link everybody in the show notes so that you can check out all of their pictures. I mean, there's so many, and they are so amazing. And I do want to say thank you to Dave Levine for snapping an awesome picture of my husband and I during the VIP set. So grateful for him in that photo. I'm terrible about (laughs) making sure we get pictures when we are on these runs and stuff. So it was so nice of him to get that picture of my husband and I, you know, dirt actually like while they were playing the VIP set. And of course we just have the biggest grins on our face because it's the best ever. So, (laughs) um, and I did want to mention the awesome two meetups over the weekend too. The first night was the Um Freaks meetup and it was so cool to finally meet some people in real life, got to meet Josh from Umfreaks Anonymous, hang out with him a couple of times over the weekend, and actually brainstorm and work on some amazing things that we're going to be bringing you in 2019 and beyond. I'm super excited about that, and I'm super excited to work with him, and just it just so awesome. Um, and then the Female Freaks meetup on Saturday was so cool hanging out with other girls, chatting about Umphreys, and totally made some new friends for life after that meetup, which is so cool to, you know, have some lady Umphreys friends. I mean, I'm sure you know that it's hard to find that. So it's nice to to finally have some female freaks. Um, So yeah, I would love to have some more meetups in the future. Um, I think it's great to get everybody, you know, behind the screens to finally meet up and hug and hang out. So maybe summer camp, Red Rocks, you know, some more meetups. Let's make it happen because I think it's super important to all hang out and grow this amazing community. Okay, so let's jump into some information about the Tabby. The Tabernacles opened in 1911, um, has a capacity of 2,600, like I mentioned earlier, and originally was a church. And yes, there is stained glass in there. And when you wander around, um, I walked around to find the bathrooms there on like different levels. And you will see, uh, you know, stained glass and like, you know, like a religious figure, like in the stained glass, which is like kind of weird when you're at a concert, but it's really cool. And there are some very cool pictures of, um, you know, like the congregation that was at the church at that time. I believe it was a Baptist church when it first started. Um, so you would, I have seen pictures of the people that were in the congregation, like outside the venue, um, you know, in the 1900s and stuff or outside the church. And it's so interesting to see you know it now and what it is but it's very cool that that the city of Atlanta did not leave it empty or dilapidated or you know knock it down or whatever that they've used it and you know put it and to really great use and made this amazing venue so that is very very cool Umphreys has played at the Tabby a total of 23 times, including this most recent run, the first time being October 14th, back in 2005, starting multi-night runs at the venue in 2011, 
doing their first New Year's Eve run in 2012, also doing New Year's Eve at the Tabby in 2014, when they did five nights from December, this was December 31st, 30th, 31st, and then January 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, and I can only imagine doing five nights like that, <laughs> like, and it actually, it did come up, you know, when I was, like, in conversation talking to people over the weekend, and there were some people that I met that had been there for that, and they were like, by night five, everybody was just so done and so tired, and, you know, I can only imagine, like, how you would feel. Um, there were openers the first three nights of this run. Southern Avenue, night one, talk night two, and Corey Wong featuring Antoine Stanley on night three, and also the late night shows, Doom Flamingo after night one, and Talking McGee after night two. That Talking McGee set is actually on Nugs, and that I will link in the show notes if you'd like to give it a listen. Um, I believe that it was Chris, Andy, Ryan, and Brendan that came out and played with Talk. Not totally sure, but I think... And yeah, like this run was nothing short of just absolutely amazing. And like I said, every single time I went back to my room after the show, I was just sitting there like, holy shit, like, wow. And there's still, you know, X amount of shows left. I know after like night one, I was like, oh my God, and we still have three more nights to go. Like my brain just couldn't even like fathom what else they were possibly going to be playing, you know, that weekend. My heart was and is still so full of gratitude and love after this weekend. Even trying to say this, like, I don't even feel like I can put into words how I feel after this weekend. Like, gratitude, I feel, doesn't even, (laughs) even, like, cap it, you know, like, it doesn't even get it. So, When I was thinking about this run and how I'd be able to bring this to you guys, this review, and talk about it, I just seriously had no idea how to. I was feeling like a little overwhelmed almost. There's so much here and there's no way that I feel that I can do it justice. I highly, highly, highly recommend that you listen to all of this run if you haven't. I know that it's a marathon. It's going to take you a little bit of time, but... It's going to be worth it. Definitely do it. This was the longest run of shows that I've ever been at that was not like a festival setting. And I was definitely tired. I will admit I was tired. I was tired when I came home. I was probably tired like a week after too because like I said, you're just getting back to normal life. But it was so worth it. My body and my feet were sore and tired. But my soul was so happy And I had the biggest smile on my face. And I still do. You know, I'm still carrying that feeling from New Year's inside of me. So I don't even care. You know, you can rest your body. You know, it you'll be fine. (laughs) And I keep telling my husband that it was the best weekend ever. And I'm pretty sure that everybody else there, you know, that experienced this weekend feels the exact same way. So let's get into it. So night one starts with Dump City and Out of Order, Higgins, which was one of the many highlights from night one for me. This is another one that they've just been slaying the entire year, and even though they had just played it at holidays, they proved with this song that anything that was played at holidays was still on the table and that they would absolutely crush it. Added this Higgins to my 2018 Hall of Fame list. Triangle Tear dedicated to the people way up at top. And if you've never been to the Tabby, and this is the first time that I've been there, and I'm probably just going to keep mentioning this so many times, it's just so interesting how it is structured and all the people that are in there. We had been in there different... um, parts of all four nights um you know having never been there before we wanted to kind of get a feel for all the different spots and night three we were on the side way side in the balcony joel side and it was insane to see how many other people were actually you know up 
above you um, when you're in that middle balcony part. So it's just very cool to see all of the people that are in there and I could not be way up in the top. <laughs> I feel like it would just be uh, too much for me. So, uh, you know, our places were good in the second balcony tier. And actually, I will link to, I believe it's the 2010 tabby run. I could be incorrect, um, but there is a video on YouTube um, that Umphreys made, Kevin made, I believe, and it is, you know, like a mini documentary about the run of shows that they did there, and I will link that in there. It's a three-part thing. It's not very long, and it's very interesting, and there is a spot in there, I believe, in part one where Jake talks about the parfait of humans, um, and the energy that comes from them and, you know, to the audience and back. It's just a very cool explanation. And I had watched that right before we went. So I thought about that, like, during the show. It was uh, very cool. So I'll make sure to link to that as well. Um, anyways, back to the uh, back to the set list here. Um, triangle tier, like I had mentioned um, August, another highlight for me from night one, and one that I had added to my top five list for the weekend, um, on my guest shop, guest spot on the Inside Out podcast with Rob and Seth. Um, I'm very grateful to have run into Rob Turner at the VIP show on Saturday, um, and I will put a link also in the show notes where you can listen to their mini episode about the Atlanta run. The guys are based from there. Um, I have not met Seth yet, but it was very awesome to speak to both of them on the phone. Um, and I definitely suggest you check out that episode and all of their episodes. They are uh, cover all jam bands and music, so definitely give them a listen for sure. Um, back into <laughs> the set list here. I keep going off on a tangent, and I feel like that's going to happen a lot in this episode. Like I said before, Atlanta was just such an amazing weekend, and I've been super pumped to bring this episode to you guys. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, this August, also added to my Hall of Fame list, Chris and Andy, who the two of them, and I've mentioned this a bunch have just been killing it in 2018 and during this entire New Year's Eve run. I, you know, pick them, honestly, as my MVP. If I had to pick one, it's so difficult to to come up with one. But that's, I mean, they were just amazing. Um, the jam that starts to lift off and gain its legs like three and a half minutes in, it just keeps chugging along until about eight minutes when... It goes stomping back into August and, of course, features this big, bold, and just beautiful Bela solo at the end. Love the Bela solo. And, I mean, he was spot on, too. Like, everybody was just A-plus the entire weekend. I mean, they are anyways, but, you know, it is it is hard to pick an MVP. But I don't know. I think, I think I'm going with Chris and Andy. Um, up next, Blue Echo, the first time that we get a taste of the effects the band had in store for us for the weekend, um, they just kind of rolled out these, uh, rock show smoke machines, and I will have to admit, I wasn't so sure at first, and they were probably feeling the same way. You know, I'm sure they did a dry run with it, but it's much different when you're in a venue full of people in the moment. Um, but it was really fucking cool. Um, it was a great addition to the beginning of that song. Um, the pictures that I have seen with the blue lights, um, I don't know if, if that was Dave or Tara's photo, um, but that was just absolutely amazing too. So... You know, the intensity when the song is starting and then it just the smoke is filling it. And I was in the, the VIP balcony section for all four nights. So I'm a little raised up as whereas the floor 
I am, you know, 5'8", so if somebody really tall is standing in front of me, I'm not going to be able to see. So I was able to see all of this, and it was just so amazing, you know, just like visually and just the feelings and, you know, building up into the music. It was, it was very, very, very cool. About a little after four minutes in, they do lay it down and let it levitate a little before sending it down a whimsical and full of confident sounding adventure for a little bit, but then gaining its speed and going back into Blue Echo and then heads off again on a jam journey a little after seven minutes in, starting out almost very timid before gaining more confidence in itself to grow, taking a moment to kind of contemplate like which direction it wants to head at like the 11 minute mark. And then it just continues with the same jam before fading out at the end and slowly growing more aggressive and going into in the black to close out the first set. Very solid first set for the first night of a four night run. Set two opens with Bridgeless that begins this whimsical, soaring, uplifting jam that really starts to take flight a little before seven minutes in, and it just continues to glide along with its wings spread super wide, and I feel like it's just spreading all of this beautiful energy all through the room bringing it down to let it lead a different path a little before 10 minutes in, just keeping with that soaring, uplifting jam, but keeping it in sort of a, I kind of would describe it as a grounded um, way before they leave the version unfinished, which will later come up um, to close out the encore of this first night. Going into example one, which gets all sorts of funky only in about three minutes in and continues on. I love the authority that comes from Jake's playing um, about six minutes into this. The power and the energy during that just absolutely gives me goosebumps and then smoothly slides into the jam again. Just like Butta, I love it when they are so smooth like that and just just beautiful. Well done. Well done, guys. Um, 40s and Joel in this, this whole jam, I mean, even Jake just shouts it out. So sick. Every person was just standing there and just watching it. I bet... My profile picture on Twitter maybe was taken during that moment. Um, And shout out to Adam Johnson. To So nice to meet you during the VIP set. Um, And your pictures are amazing. So if you are not following him on Twitter and checking out his stuff, I will link all of his information in the show notes as well. Definitely give him a follow for sure. Um, going into the 40s, I'm going to say I never really get behind that song. Um, that's another one that I kind of felt the same way with attachments. Um, I was hating on that song. You know, I don't, I want to say hate. It's such a, such a negative word, but not my favorite song. And I don't know, just the jam that comes out of this one and I honestly love how Bayla says, I don't even know what day it is because I was already feeling that way with night one. And then, of course, you know, with the holidays only a couple days before. So you're in that awkward stage where nobody knows what day it is and what the hell is going on. So we're all like, fuck, yeah, we know exactly how that feels. And by the end of the run, that was just magnified 100 percent. So. Um, this jam starts off slow and kind of timid at about three and a half minutes in, but then starts to gain some more confidence. Bayless's romantic solo that starts to really show its light about six minutes in and grows into this beautiful, confident, 
luminous being and carries this jam triumphantly on its back into the bold ending of 40s. And then Jake is just coming in to completely rip it all the way open for us and just rage the fuck out. Much obliged, dedicated to Allie for her 200th show, which is absolutely fucking awesome. So shout out to you and kudos. Um, From about halfway through this one, all through its slow, big, beautiful build up back into the song. This is again one of those jams that's super inspirational, giving you the push to, you know, the push and the drive you need to trudge through that shitty stuff in life. I've added this one to my 2018 Hall of Fame list too. Just beautiful music, very inspiring, just wonderful. Definitely give that one a listen for sure. Um, Taking it into Wife Soup that gets dark sounding about seven minutes in, but slowly comes up with, again, a beautiful Bela solo that just begins to illuminate and kind of like I think of powering the dark that started out that jam and then the big ending of white wife soup is always gorgeous then (laughs) we get time by pink floyd that was just completely out of this world and apparently a request by mindy if you don't know mindy you should she's amazing and gives the best hugs um apparently it was a nod to her 20th wedding anniversary, which is absolutely amazing. Congratulations to you and your husband. Um, and this cover was just absolutely amazing. Um, the anticipation in the room as they were about to go into it, you know, again, the energy in that room. And the beginning with Chris. Just wow. I mean, like I said, again, it just wow. And there are moments of this show, of this weekend that, you know, the memory I will never forget. And I think that this is, this is definitely up there as one of them where it's just, I will hear that song, you know, even if it's the original version, I feel like it could be anybody singing that song and I will be taken back to that moment. Um, the smoke machines again, the crowd was singing it, all of it. It just, it brings the biggest smile to my face and it just, it fills my heart up so much. Like it was just absolutely amazing. I actually included this on my top five moments from the weekend list as well. Um, on the podcast with Rob and Seth and it just, it's just absolutely, I mean, even just listening back to it, you're, you will feel that, but anybody that was there is just, and Jake is just absolutely filthy in this, and, you know, I've said so many times that I could just listen to him play anything by Pink Floyd anytime, and it was just beautiful, um, this song has had a show gap of 139 shows, The last time that one was covered was April 22nd, 2017 at the House of Blues in Dallas, Texas. And I also loved that they went into the ending of the song, I believe is called Breathe Reprise. I'm not sure um, if it's still time or if it has a different um, name. Um, but when they did, everybody went nuts. I mean, I know for us local in Buffalo, when a radio station is playing time, mostly they don't go into the end part of that. Um, it tells you the caliper of the, uh, radio station about whether or not they go into that. Um, so for them to do it and not stop and, you know, or jam it out and take it into something else, um, I think everybody just loved it every second of that. Um, It was just absolutely amazing to hear and to see and to be a part of. And it was just very, very cool. Um, Encore, in the kitchen, again, just absolutely just killing it and flooring it. Like it just, I, I don't even know, like 
blew my mind with the snow. Yes, the snow. If you did not know, it was snowing. <laughs> um, I heard that it was shaved soap, but I'm unsure if that is true. But it was just absolutely amazing. Christmas just to a whole new level with the Carol of the Bells jam in there. It, I, I've added this to my top five uh, moments of the weekend, too. I added this to my Hall of Fame list. It was just amazing. Again, like, it's, there are many times this weekend that I felt speechless as well, just shaking my head at how amazing they really are. Um, this version, too, will remain unfinished until set three of night four, so now it would be 2019, and I am going to give my husband a shout out because I told him I would. Um, I don't listen back to any of the shows really until we're traveling back. There's just usually so much going on during the runs, it's hard for me to really listen to. Like, I'll have it on in the hotel room or whatever, but he called this in the kitchen being unfinished and I did not realize that so he had called it I was unsure and it came back night four and he was so proud of himself so I wanted to give him a shout out for that for sure um the jam in this one from night one Stasic really is the backbone for a lot a lot of it keeping that funky bass line throughout. And like I said, added this one to my Hall of Fame list. You're definitely going to want to give this one a listen. This may very well be the best in the kitchen for the year. They bring this jam back down, going back into the Carol of Bells jam that revs back up and goes into the end of Bridgeless to close out night one. And I love how Brendan and Jake play off each other at the end of this tune. Stasic being turned way up during this jam too. And he's just laying down some nasty thick bass lines. With this show, the band totally showed all of us that we most certainly have better be ready for this fucking weekend. Because they were. So strap in everybody. Here we go. Um, and I will make sure to put everything that I find, videos, set lists, pictures, um, anything, will all be in the show notes where you can just check out all of this New Year's Eve run insanity all yourself. All right. VIP set happening Saturday, December 29th, 2018 during the afternoon for anyone that purchased a VIP package, and I will say it was totally worth every penny. I love the v the VIP sets. Having an amazing view and a seat um, as an option on a four-night run like this is amazing. I don't care who you are, but we're all tired at some point during that run for sure, and it was nice to have a seat. I did not use my seat during the show and, you know, nothing to anybody who does. I mean, I fucking get it. It was hot in there, especially on night four. And, you know, your legs are tired because we also did stuff in the city. So it's like, you know, I get it. Um, but during set break, it's nice to have a place to sit down for sure. Drink some water and, like, collect your thoughts after your brain was just melted by all the amazingness. Um... <laughs> But the VIP set is also an awesome little addition to the weekend. 45 minutes, and this one was like five minutes long. And my husband and I were talking about the day that they do a VIP set, and it's just two really jammed out songs. I think that would be amazing. Or some fucking ridiculous 45-minute utopian fur. Like, that would be super awesome, too. Um, so, those are my suggestions. If they want to they wanna take that, I wouldn't be mad. Um, plus, it is nice with the VIP set to be able to be really close because we were on the floor. And there was, like, I would say 50 of us, you know, maybe more than that, but not very much more. So, it's nice to be able to be up close and not have 900 bazillion people up you, like, all the time. 
um, you know, some people do like that, but for me, you know, it's nice to have room and, and have that intimate, you know, setting too, because the band is just right there and it's, it just feels so different. Um, this VIP set opened with Speak Up, Stasic laying down some thick bass throughout the whole jam, starting a little after six minutes in, but really spreading it around extra thick. Joel coming in to bring his own soul and then bringing this jam on its merry little way, kind of like skipping along and taking it back into Speak Up. The fuzz, which myself and a bunch of others in attendance were very excited, and I was honestly surprised to get. Um, I do know, you know, they did play it at holidays, and I know, you know, they played August and Higgins the night before, so anything was on the table, like I said, but I didn't think that they would play the fuzz again. So it was definitely a nice little surprise and one that, you know, I was hoping to catch. And I'm very happy that we did because it was awesome. The fuzz, thin air into Kimball was just absolutely delicious. Joel begins to take us on this jam odyssey beginning in the fuzz at about five minutes. That sounds a little like outer space honky tonk. And I feel like it could have gone into a tease of Dixieland any minute, but it did not. Joel taking the lead on this one and laying the path for Jake to go down this mystical sounding jam that then evolves into a dance party with Stasic again laying some thick, delicious bass lines. They lay it down for a little bit, slow it down, and slyly, just so slyly, slink into thin air gets all sexy with its jam about three minutes in and Joel is just beautiful I can just hear it I just I love it <laughs> Andy and Chris a little after five minutes in taking this jam a completely different direction with the calypso -y beach vibe going on again hats off to Andy and Chris man I'm telling you um, Brendan and Jake with the dueling guitars, and this is one duel that every single person wins 100% of the time. <laughs> um, stepping right into Kimball, which always brings all of the feels. And if you've ever seen Reel to Reel, you know it's the perfect song for the beginning of that film, and... Every time we start a road trip, I honestly think of that song being like the beginning of a new adventure or a new chapter in your life. Um, and if you have not seen Reel to Reel, I highly suggest that you do. Um, if I can find it somewhere, I'll link it, but I'm not sure. But I will look for it. Um, they end this VIP set with Ringo that goes on this wonderful and mystical jam only after two and a half minutes in gain some speed and confidence that grows into this gorgeous jam that just goes off a full force, pivots quickly to run full speed into the end of Ringo. You think it's over, but no. Chris takes us into this funky jam, Joel coming along with it, and then bringing everyone in to deliver that dirtiness to the end of Ringo. I think this was honestly a really, really good VIP set list choice and absolute, absolutely worth the price of admission. They really got everyone um, that was there ready for all the amazingness that was going to come ahead for night two. All right, brings us to night two, which opens with a gurgle. Honestly, is starting to become my new favorite intro that they come out to. Um, intro, whatever you want to call it. I know there's some people that call it something different. I can't remember what it is, so I'm going with intro. I love how it really builds the foundation for the rest of how the show is going to go. Kind of like a little preview of we are ready to do this. Um, then it rips into the junk with a Stasic laying down some serious funk a little over three minutes in and then goes on to open up this beautiful jam that seriously, I know, gave every single person in that room 
just the biggest smile on their face. I mean, talking about it right now, I feel the exact same way. And when I was listening back to it too, it just, it just makes you so freaking happy. So, you know, if you really want to feel freaking happy, just listen to that to junk. It just, you just feel super grateful to have this band around and playing. So yeah, that, that'll be your, uh, your feel good moment for the day. And again, this is a very strong start to the show and definitely the band was showing that it did not matter that it was night two, that if they were tired, they certainly were not showing it. And that's the case during this weekend, you know, like Jake could have been dead ass tired, but I can tell you that there was no sign of it. So, you know, when they came out rearing to go for night two, it was like, all right, well, hope everybody took a nap because we better be ready to, um, they keep that junk unfinished and slow it down toward the end to get a more romantic and whimsical vibe to it before sliding gently into upward, Always beautiful, of course, we know. Uh, Two by two that decides to take a funky path a little after seven minutes. I imagine this jam just kind of skip funky dancing along. This jam also features Can't You Hear Me Knocking by the Rolling Stone teases throughout. It takes a minute to kind of stay in place and then to lay a thick layer of some funk and gathering some friends before building back up into the jam, continuing to chug along for a little while while the jam comes down at 13 minutes, then builds back up again, but only for a minute or two before going a different way entirely, heading toward a way that maybe is a little darker, more mysterious, bringing this one almost all the way down before heading right headfirst into the very intense, deep, ominous, and aggressive ending of two by two before, again, you know, this beautiful Bela solo bursting open a little after 17 minutes in and just bringing this vibrant light to this jam, which is how I personally always view Bela solos, especially when they come at the end of excuse me, a song like that, I feel that it's just kind of like this light or this flower almost that I visualize. Sometimes it's like closed and then it just, sometimes it opens really slowly and sometimes it just bursts right open. And that's, you know, kind of how I feel (laughs) about that. Um, Stinkos, which you can never go wrong with Stinkos, of course, ever. And while you, of course, can always say that no two Umphrey songs are the same, you know, you hear it here and then you hear it here and they're two different versions, but that is a thousand million percent true about Stinkos. And again, this is another example of the type of song that I love from Umphrey's. This massive, impressive jam of a song that at one point, and only those that really know this song know this, these lyrics that come from Bayless, and I just, I love it, because those lyrics are always, like, the most meaningful ones ever, you know, like, they just hit you right in the soul after this amazing jam that happened. I feel like songs like this would be amazing in, like, a super dramatic scene in a movie about somebody's life. This over 16 minute version, especially the first eight minutes, and of course, Jake just shredding the hell out of this about six minutes in, and then here comes Chris just killing it, of course, and Joel, everyone just building onto this. I just stand there and watch it. I just love to stand there at moments, like I love to dance my ass off at shows, but there are moments where... I just want to stand there and watch because it's so awesome. (laughs) Like, I just want to get, you know, as much in my brain, like just visually as much as possible. So sometimes it's hard to dance and, and still do that. 
there are just so many times during the weekend where I just did that, you know, just amazed at the level of talent and professionalism too from from all of them. Just, you know, obviously they're up there having the time of their lives, but they're still like still see that it is work and they're putting it in still and it's just it's very cool to be a part of watch you know watching it and witnessing them you know do that it's very cool um (laughs) then they take that jam and step it right into stinkos it just makes me smile every time and again definitely give this one a listen if you want just listen to the whole show I mean really you should be doing that anyways um (laughs) then came band on the run which I told my husband that I would try not to spend too much time talking about this but for me this is right up there as the greatest moments of my life band on the run the album and Paul McCartney as a musician are very important to me. Um, personal side note, um, my parents divorced when I was a teenager. And when they split up and my dad moved out and we started doing the weekend dad thing, one of the things that my dad and I did was listen to his records. And... You know, these bands that Umphreys covers now and is obviously influenced by them are the bands that we listen to. And it was so important to me, you know, to have that time. And when my dad passed in 2006, it was huge for me. And I hadn't discovered Umphreys yet. I didn't find them until 2007. So it was like nine months um, after he passed that I found them. And every single time I've been to a show, and this show we're talking about here was my 50th Umphreys show, um, I've thought about him. You know, I've thought about how much he would have loved this, how much, you know, this cover or, you know, these things that I would have loved to share with him. Um, you know, and even, you know, listening back anytime that I listen to Umphreys, I, I think about my dad and band on the run was a huge song for us. And it's one that I've always loved. And I was finally able to get a copy of the vinyl again. Um, my husband was able to find one for me and, you know, it was super important and I have wanted to hear them play band on the run live ever since I started listening to them. And I've listened to versions of it, um, you know, one day hoping that it would happen. And it did. And it was awesome. And it was amazing. (laughs) And I totally cried. And I'm totally going to cry now talking about it. And I don't even care. (laughs) Because it was amazing. And it was everything that I thought it was going to be in so much more and the fact that it happened at my 50th show and I didn't even ask for any kind of request or anything I decided I wasn't going to I was completely blown away and I I still am you know after they play that my husband's just looking at me and I had nothing to say you know at set break I was just completely like holy shit that totally just happened it was you know, absolutely amazing for me. I mean, and and it's just a lot of that is because of the emotional attachment to that song. And, you know, then when I came home and shared that with my kids and we were listening back to it and everybody was singing and it was just such an awesome example of how music can just make you feel and have you remember and all of these things. So, yeah, that was that was just absolutely amazing and I'm so grateful. <laughs> Trying not to be super emotional, but I am so grateful to Umphreys too um for playing that song and and just doing what you do and being there and being amazing and just thank you. Just just so grateful. So Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm I'm done with my emotional uh, part of it. Let's get back to the uh, the seriousness of this. So that 
cover was also quite a bust out for the band. Last played 781 shows ago, uh, February 20th, 2011, at the National in Richmond. Um, so I know I'm not the only one in the room that was super excited about hearing that. So, yeah, and if you haven't heard back to it, I mean, it's just, it's so great, and I've been waiting forever to hear Jake play that song, and like I said, I'm just so grateful and happy, and just, music is fucking amazing. <laughs> That's just how I feel. Um, Then maybe someday to close out the first set, which... On the set list, they had a jazz odyssey going back into Maybe Someday, but after that amazing first set, it's best to just leave it the way that it was and take a breather and head into the second set just as strong. Um, I honestly, like I said, I was so speechless when that set was over, completely blown away by just them playing anyways, and you know, then that band on the run and two by two and just the whole first set was absolutely amazing. And before I forget, I do want to give a huge shout out to Sam who totally scored me a set list like two days after, um, this night I asked him, you know, Hey, if there's still a set list kicking around, could you grab it for me? Because, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's super important to me. And he totally came through with a set list, had it signed for me. And now it is framed and hanging on the wall of the podcast office. So that was very awesome of him. So I'm super grateful for that. Sam, thank you for being so awesome. Oh, and if you did not know, um, I did have the pleasure of interviewing Sam Last year, uh, after the show had like just started, episode four, um, so really early on in the beginning, he's been a huge supporter of the show from the very beginning, letting me leave cards at merch. Um, just such an awesome dude. I will link to his interview in the show notes so you can give that a listen. Very cool to hear his uh, his take on fatherhood and you know being on tour and stuff like that. So definitely going to want to check that out. Um, set two, which opens with the floor, which when a set or a show opens with the floor, you know that it is time to step it up, put on your big boy pants, and let's do this second set. Stasic and Andy really starting to build this bold, ominous jam monster up to the ceiling almost, bringing it down to gain more allies in Chris and Jake, and then continue to slowly grow this more and more. This is another spot in the weekend that I will always remember the energy that was coming from the stage and filling like the entire room during this jam, something I don't think I will ever forget. I've added this one to my Hall of Fame list um, as well. The energy and the journey of this jam. And when you think that we might very well be at the peak of it, they just spread it all over to slowly collect back into itself and go back into the floor. The crowd is like obviously fucking losing their minds. I love listening back to these shows any shows, really, just to hear the crowd again, just to, you know, like, I will get goosebumps from hearing the crowd cheering after a fucking amazing jam, or, you know, whatever, like, it will take me back to there, or I will feel like I'm there, it's, it's just so awesome, and sometimes you will catch some pretty random shit that people say, which is always really funny, too, you know, some, Something you're not expecting. I remember the one that comes to mind is a show that was pretty recent. And I think, like, the lady screams, like, Chris, you are my tiger, or something completely random like that. But you're not expecting it when you're listening back to these shows. So it's a nice little comical thing in there, too, that is also really great. 
Um, Wappy Sprayberry, stay sick, bringing the funk again a little over four minutes in and sending this jam along on its way. Stay sick is definitely the VIP of this entire jam. Another thing I don't think I will ever forget is his bass a little over eight minutes in and just watching him play those notes, the rest of the jam building and growing around it. Again, like I said, there are moments where I just like to stand there and watch. And this was one of those moments, just that sound that was coming out of him, you know, through him, through his instrument. It was just, it was just so cool. It's <laughs> just so awesome. Um, I mean, this night two for me, and I don't know if I mentioned this, I, I may have mentioned this, but this night and not even, you know, taking band on the run out of the equation really sealed it for me. Not only that this band is obviously something very, very special on so many levels. I mean, we could probably go on and on about that for hours, but how I feel about them. Like, I'm like, if there was even a tiny little piece of me that didn't love them, which I don't even think was possible, like, that piece is gone now. Like, the way that I feel about this band and this community and being a part of this, it, it was just, it, it was just like, yes, like, obviously. It's just, I'm, I'm grateful and honored and humbled to be able to watch them play. And, you know, be a part of this community with these amazing people and this family that is, you know, I'm closer to these people than my own family. And, and it, that's okay. Like, I'm okay with that because my family sucks. Besides, like, my kids and my husband. Um, you know, so it, it's just, I just, I'm so grateful. And I just want to keep saying that because I am. I'm just, this weekend made me feel so just grateful just absolutely grateful um yeah so we'll get back to this <laughs> then this dirty grimy and like some sort of ectoplasm kind of vision is like growing and like you know contracting like this sort of thing that is the sound that's coming from Stasic that's just like what I see in my mind just completely nasty and then it just builds this way, 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 way up, gains some balls, and then just explodes all over the place into the end of Wappy, then right into Remind Me with this kinky and sexy jam that really takes hold a little after six minutes in and continues to seduce before pivoting at eight and a half minutes in to go right into the sex metal part of the song. Love it. Love that part of the song. Amazing. Bayless does mention at the end, if his memory serves him right, um, the last time that they were there for the New Year's Eve run at the Tabby, that song was written by the band and the crowd. So letting everybody know that that is their song too, which is very cool. I did not know that. Then, into YYZ by Rush, oh my god, <laughs> another huge bust out of the night, I completely lost my shit during this one too, the looks that my husband was giving me that last night, and... You know, it made me think we, you know, we talked the next morning, obviously, about the show. And, you know, then we started talking about podcast stuff and, and interviews and stuff. And I told him that I would love to interview him and ask him what it's like to be married to somebody like me that loves a band so much. And he just kind of smiled at me and didn't really have a response. So I'm still waiting for the answer to that. And uh, when I get it, I will definitely pass it along because I would love to know what that's like. This YYZ was absolutely amazing. Last played 324 shows ago on May 1st, 2015, during quarter two of Um Bowl 6 at the Brooklyn Bowl in Las Vegas. 
I don't think I can even describe it for you how that whole place it just was so into the cover. Stasic, you know, amazing job with it too. I mean, they all fucking crushed it. And Chris, well, I mean, he is just out of this world. We all know that. And like I said, I'm picking him as the MVP for 2018. Um, then they let him just have the floor for a little bit and he just kills it and just, ugh. And like I said, MVP of 2018. And if you did not know, Umfreaks Anonymous is doing a 2018 year in review survey. Um, I will link that in the show notes too. I believe you have until like the middle of February or something. Um, you know, who you thought the MVP was, the best show, you know, just a nice little survey about 2018 and your thoughts and it's awesome. Definitely check it out and get your opinion in there. And like I said, I will link that in the show notes and do yourself a favor and listen to that YYZ because they fucking crushed it. (laughs) Half delayed plunger and an absolutely beautiful den to close out the second set of this out of this world show this den has admittedly started some dance parties in my kitchen with my two youngest and myself while making dinner or you know sometimes pancakes on sunday and there's zero shame with that uh the episode um this is just this uh excuse me this version is just absolutely ridiculous jake is just ripping it all over and the whole, the way the whole song comes down at the end and everybody leaves the stage and Joel is just out there playing at the end. I just absolutely love it. It's just so beautiful. And again, another moment where you just kind of stand there and, and just look and just watch. For the encore, they come out and give us a full band wait around. Another one that I was super pumped to get. They killed it on my 50th show. I'm so grateful for that, too. And, you know, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know I've been itching for a full band wait around. And I totally got it. And it was absolutely beautiful in person. And, you know, when it drops in about two minutes into the song... Jake is so emotional and raw and grimy in this song, and it's just perfect. It's perfect for this song. It's perfect for the lyrics that Bayless is singing. It's just, it's beautiful. (laughs) The last two minutes of this song, too, it's just the exact reason why I love the full full band version of it you know they needed everybody to fill all of that space just with this beautiful music and I love it then they take that and scoot right in to the end of the junk to close out this second night and like I said this second night was just awesome they all were awesome and it's so hard to pick you know, pick the best night, but I feel like just night two, the flow was just totally there. So that brings us to night three, and I will admit, I was definitely tired going into this show. This was the first time I've done a four-night run, and, you know, of course, you're doing other stuff around the city and everything, so... Not for the faint of heart. If you've never done a long run like this, you definitely have to take that into consideration when you are planning out your time, you know, with the city and stuff, of course. Um, But with anything else you're doing, definitely um, take all of that into consideration. But, of course, being tired totally went out the window when the lights go down and I heard them gearing up to go into 1348. Later on, you can be tired. Right now, it's time to rage. And you know with a song as strong as 1348 to start, you know they're ready to go. Again, no sign from them that they were tired. This one begins its jam journey almost four and a half minutes in, switching gears and getting a more 
romantic and whimsical path about nine minutes in, taking this full speed into a soaring, uplifting jam to just inspire the hell out of you. Like, honestly, like, that's how I feel. Jake blowing minds during this entire thing, just shredding all over the place, bringing it back down, and honestly, whatever Bayless is either playing or something, I've heard it before, and I feel like we'll most certainly hear that in the future, whatever that is at the end of it, you know, maybe it is something and I'm not catching it, or it's something that is growing and we will see it, you know, much bigger in 2019 and beyond. We will see. And if you know, if it is something and you know, please let me know. Reach out to the show, email me, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Reach out to me and let me know because I really like to know this kind of stuff. Um, this version will go unfinished for now, taking it into seasons, then this slacker after which Umphreys did release an official video of it, and I will add that to the show notes so you can watch that if you have not, or maybe you just want to watch it again because it's fucking sweet. Um, um, I've most certainly watched it and listened to it a couple times because it is, the Slacker Jam is absolutely amazing, and also added to the 2018 Hall of Fame list. Um, This jam begins to gear up for liftoff only a little after two and a half minutes in. That's it. Two and a half minutes in and it's ready to go. Gearing up momentum and strength before sending this off into a total dance party. While I did not add this to my initial top five from the weekend that I uh, talked about on the Inside Out podcast, the list was constructed having not listened to everything back again. Um, But this one is definitely up there for the best parts of the weekend, for sure. Best jams, dancing all the way back into Slacker, 11 and a half minutes in, and then Bayless exploding with his solo about 13 minutes. This version coming in at over 15 minutes was by no means lacking. And you can tell by the crowd when this is over how we all felt about it in that moment. Do yourself a favor and listen to it. Watch that YouTube video. (laughs) You're welcome. Push and pull next, which honestly felt oddly placed, but still always sweet, and go does get a little weird with its ending before taking it into Utopian Fur with Misunderstanding by Genesis Tease that Umphreys posted a video with Jake and Joel practicing this at Holiday's That was very cool, too. I will try to link that in the show notes as well if you haven't, if you have not uh, seen that video. And again, if you didn't know, they played that. Jake and Brendan played that at the 2018 holiday show with Jen Hartswick. Chatted about that in last week's episode, which I will also link um, if you did not listen to that. I am super excited for that to come out as a full band cover It will at some point, might be another five years from now, but we will get it, and I cannot wait. I will be waiting very patiently. Um, They go back into Utopian seamlessly, so seamlessly, bringing it down to switch gears three and a half minutes in. This jam that it begins to go on at one point did feel like they could have gone right into Flying by the Beatles, but did not, kept along their own path. This jam commanding a lot of power, really gaining a ton of energy and exploding full on, then coming back down to earth only to rev up and head back into Utopian a little after 13 minutes in. This Utopian coming in at about 20 and a half minutes was most certainly a musical adventure that continues to even get all sorts of weird and eerie with the ending part of the song. Definitely give that Utopian a listen. Made to Measure, the first time played in 2018. Very nice to see you. Last time that one saw the light of day was March 18th, 2017 at the Will Turn in Los Angeles, California. This one featured Jeff Coffin on saxophone, the very first time we will see him during the weekend, and we will see him much more. This was well worth the wait. 
The last five minutes of this are so romantic, and I love everything that he offers to this song. Very nice choice, and like I said, worth the wait for sure. Virtual Insanity by Jamiroquai with Jeff Coffin and Corey Wong with Jake on Keys. This was the first time that they have covered that song and the first time that they have covered anything from Jamiroquai. I know that there has been a push from the fans, from some fans, to cover Jamiroquai song. So some people were definitely feeling it and loving it. Chris was so, so perfect to sing this song. And I was blown away by Corey Wong's talent, not only during this, but also during his opening set as well. Very talented dude. You should definitely give him a check out for sure. And Coffin just slays the end of this. Very awesome way to end the first set. All right. So set two opens with Little Gift that gets instantly ripped and goes into a delicious Ocean Billy. It doesn't matter. Ocean Billy sandwich. The first part of this Billy sandwich features Jake just ripping the jam from five and a half minutes in until the downhill climb and slowing it down at seven minutes and gently move into a snippet of footsteps by Pearl Jam. This very sweet and romantic jam before Bayless comes in with the lyrics. This would be a very awesome thing to hear them cover in its entirety and maybe them putting it out there is seeing how it plays so they can bring it to the table in the future while the that footsteps jam was the delicate toppings of the sandwich we really get to the meat when they go into it doesn't matter and this one I know I've mentioned a couple of times This song is not even a year old at the time of this episode's recording, and it has really, really matured in that short amount of time. And having it in this sandwich really allowed it to grow in a whole new way, getting a little more confidence and growing, giving itself some balls about the seven-minute mark, almost deciding that it has grown enough to just, like, not take anybody's shit anymore. And I like to think of these jams sometimes as a character in a story and the way that they grow and they change and they take on these different characteristics. This one goes right into just a straight rage mode about nine minutes. Shows how big and bad this one really can be if it wants to. I love that strong, angry, and aggressive guitar that Jake plays right there. And they bring it down for a little bit in a temptress sort of way, I think. And then building it right back up and back into it doesn't matter. Letting the end of that one play out before going into the tail end of Ocean Billy. Delicious. Definitely give it a listen. Can't Rock My Dream Face with a show gap of 282. This one has only been played one other time, October 31st, 2015, at the Riverside Theater in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. This version featured Antoine Stanley and was exactly the dance party that the second set needed. This tune, if you did not know, is a mashup of Fleetwood Mac, Michael Jackson, and The Weeknd. And I will admit, being a fan of Fleetwood Mac, I enjoy the way that Jake sings this, and it is honestly... Probably one of my favorite mashups on the Zonky album. And if you don't know about that album, I will link that in this the show notes as well. So you can check that out. Um, then a standalone all in time to close out the second set, which is always a very solid choice to close out a set or a show for sure. The jam in this one already getting headed off about three minutes in. Stasic laying the ground with some funky bass licks for sure actually throughout pretty much all of this jam really and like I said everyone was spot on all weekend but Ryan really like he's right up there too with Chris like the two of them just this year have you know grown so much and it makes me excited really to see them together as a band playing in 2019 but them individually too as musicians you know where they expand in 2019 is going to be very exciting to to watch for sure 
Andy again showing up hard in this one, coming down around the nine minute mark and starting to get a little weird on Jake's part. Chris and Ryan keeping the backbone strong, switching gears a little after 11 minutes in, growing and growing and setting itself right into the end of All in Time. Then, of course, the gorgeous ending of this song, which we all know what I mean, all the feels and the romance behind Jake's playing. And then Bayless's heartfelt lyrics and Brennan and Jake playing off each other, just watching that live. You you can't help but be filled with so much love and just straight up happiness. Just serious, just straight up bliss. The build up into the ending, the lights from Waffle. I always get so excited during the build up into the ending and then just dance my heart out so hard. Such an awesome stress relief of a tune. I love it. Encore, the triple wide featuring one verse, not even a verse. It's listed as a quote on the set list on all things Umphreys. Dreams by Fleetwood Mac, which they have covered as a full band only a total of four times. Last time being April 13th, 2013. So maybe this one we could get it dusted off in 2019. I would love that. Like I mentioned like Fleetwood Mac, a whole bunch. Um, Before going into that snippet of dreams, the jam in this triple wide that really starts to begin its transition into its own jam at about the three and a half minute mark and continues on until about four minutes, coming down and becoming more seductive and just beautifully dancing along slowly and so sexy, teasingly heading into jams turning it into a dance party and I think that the next time they play this fully it should just be turned into a full-on dance party because it would be absolutely amazing and we all know that (laughs) we certainly get a taste of how it would be after the lyrics and before going back into the triple wide please 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 guys bring this cover back at summer camper red rocks not a show I'm not at, please. <laughs> um, toying with the idea of going back into the triple wide, but instead deciding to bring back the enormous rage monster that was 1348 to open the entire show, making night three a mouthwatering and delectable 1348 sandwich. So that finally brings us to night four, which... I, like I mentioned before, it was so fucking hot inside of the tabby that night. So hot. So hot. But I didn't even give a shit. It did not stop me from dancing my ass off and loving every second of this amazing show. The three-set New Year's Eve party opened with The Silent Type, a tune that if you are not a fan of the lyrics or the actual song, they totally make it make you love it with the way they've been jamming this one out for sure. Like... I wasn't even sure about this song, too, at first. Super, like, poppy kind of to me. My almost four-year-old loves it, dances his ass off every time. But the jamming out that they're doing with it now is amazing. This version is no exception. The jam in this one begins to set off on its own about the four-minute mark, settling into a soaring, uplifting jam that continues to soar on until about seven and a half minutes when it begins to skip along into a dance party, Breaking down into the silent type a little after nine minutes in with Stasic laying some seriously fatty bass lines. Him on New Year's Eve, I'll tell you, like he, like I said, he was spot on all weekend, but New Year's Eve, he's definitely bringing it. While it's worth, um, Cemetery Walk 2, this one that features Bayless on the keys with Joel in the beginning, I added this. Cemetery Walk 2 to my Hall of Fame list, and it was the final selection of my top five favorite moments of the weekend um, on the Inside Out podcast. This is a dance party from the word go, Stasic again laying down the thick bass, being pretty much the backbone of this jam, continuing on until they bring it in to a complete halt at a little after five minutes in, taking a few minutes before heading very determined back down that same jam path, bringing it down and slowly allowing it to gain its legs again so it can start power walking its way into the next part of the jam, 
taking it into another soaring, uplifting jam at about 10 minutes. Brendan comes back over and we get some dueling guitar really, really going about 11 minutes in and taking that high, insane energy all the way back into Cemetery Walk to 13 minutes in and finishing this one up with, of course, the beautiful Joel solo at the end. Then Cemetery Walk, the first time that they have played these two songs in that order, Joel slowing the song down to start building the suspense and drama of this tune a little af- little before five minutes in. And before, you know, then Jake comes in to start this romantic and bold playing, slaying the end of this one all the way up until the song ends and they leave it hanging in the air just like hang in there and then changing directions going into Xmas at wartime just such a beautiful tune and I'm sure I mentioned this before but if I have not for some reason um this song is written by Jake and it's about what he envisioned when he thought about the stories his grandfather used to tell about being in the trenches during the Battle of the Bulge during World War II, which was in December. Um, Jake's dad actually told me that story when we went to Boondock last year, and it was very, very cool to hear him share that with us. Um, I will say a lot of times this song is kind of weird in the placement of on the set list where they put it um, recently. And I feel that way here, Um, but it's still, you know, it's just a beautiful song. I love hearing it, you know, the lights and the snow that was going on. And now I know what it means to Jake. So, you know, it's, you know, it's a little, you feel a little differently about it now. Then came surprise number one for the evening, Roundabout by Yes. Holy shit. (laughs) Which... I totally screamed like a 12-year-old girl at a Bieber concert when they finally went into it. So many times I have been teased with the beginning of this damn song. So many times. And they were going to, you know, they start playing the beginning of it. And I am standing there and my husband's looking at me like, you know... And I'm like shaking my head. No, nope. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Motherfucker. It happened. And I screamed so loud. (laughs) The look on his face is, is priceless. It was just like, holy shit. Look at her. She's so crazy. (laughs) But I didn't even care because I've been waiting for so long uh, to hear this song and I do know that the Facebook group that constantly changes names I'm sure you know what I'm talking about um there was a thread in there that some guy had posted that his mom was sick and he was taking her to the show on New Year's Eve and she loved yes and it would be really cool if they would play a song and it would mean you know all this to her and they totally did it So not only was it this amazing bust out for everybody else, like everybody else was so excited that we were finally getting it, but it totally meant everything to this guy and his mom in the audience. And that's just absolutely amazing. This one, they have covered only a total of nine times, including this one on New Year's Eve. The last one played before New Year's Eve was back on June 28th, 2015 at the Limelight Eventplex in Peoria, Illinois. Chris slays singing this just totally. Every single time I've listened back to this, like Ryan too, man, it really did well on this. Joel at the end of the tune. I mean, everybody, Jake in the beginning, just everybody, everybody killed it in this. Everything that I dreamed it would be and so much more. I'm really hoping that they release a video of this um, because they released a video of Slacker and Kamalator, I believe it was. So I'm hoping they release a video of this. They have not yet at the uh, time of recording this podcast episode. So hopefully they do because that'd be so fucking sweet. Um, Like I said, I, I, everybody, everybody was super excited. I'm still super excited talking about it. Like it was just amazing. And this was only the first of the amazing covers that were going to come the rest of the evening. 
rocked a puss to close out the first set of this New Year's Eve run. Still only a tease of Nether at the end. Perhaps we will see it finally in 2019. But, I don't know. Maybe it'll just be the, uh, you know, never to actually see the light of day song. And everybody just has blue balls for the rest of their lives over Nether. I don't know. We'll have to see. Set 2 opens with a Draconin that begins to head on its own journey a little over five minutes after seeming a little grounded for a bit, almost like it's gaining more ammunition to completely propel off at any moment, which it really begins to do at nine minutes, finally getting off and running and gaining some air. Again, this is one of those songs, like I said about Stinkos, where there's this massive jam that is just amazing and always its own musical story. And then it comes into these Bayless lyrics Stasic is so funky in this one. I really enjoy what he's adding to it. Then there's, they switch gears and get ready to go into the lyrics. Jake just playing the end of this song. And I don't know, maybe it's the eclecticness of this tune that I like so much about it. Because the part with the lyrics is always, you know, so different from the jam in the beginning. I don't know. I just love this one. And I think I'm finally starting to figure out how to say the name correctly. I don't know. Maybe I will always get it wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> um, River People by Weather Report only covered one other time, December 29th, 2013 in Denver at the Fillmore. This is the first time that we get to see Mad Dog and his filthy little secret. I will admit I do not know anything about this song or anything about the band but I still can get down to this because I mean I will listen to anything that Umphreys plays and give it a chance um like I said I didn't know like at this point when they were playing it whether or not it was a cover or just a jam whatever um because I don't I try not to check my phone during the set at all like unless it's important I just want to be, like, absorbed in the moment. So I had no idea what it was at that time, but I thought it was good, and I thought they did a really good job with it. Whistle Kids, also with Mad Dog. Love what they've added to this song. It's a perfect addition to this kind of song. Gents only played a total of 15 times, the last time June 3rd, 2017, at Mountain Music Festival in Minden, West Virginia. I love how dirty this one is. When it starts out, the authority that this song commands and Joel solo only about a minute in, this song is definitely something out of some sort of a thriller movie. Keeps building up and up and then collides right into looks that definitely comes down at about three minutes in and then gets its balls and goes right into Dr. Feelgood, originally done by Motley Crue, covered by the band a total of 46 times. Last time they took that one for a spin was February 3rd, 2016 at the College Street Music Hall in New Haven, Connecticut. They do bring it down to cool it off for a little bit. And then you can hear looks creeping in really slowly and a little can't you hear me knocking tease again. Then they build the jam all the way up and just end it, <laughs> which is very interesting. I would have liked to see them go back into looks for a little bit, you know, kind of jam out the end of it. Um, but it was still really good. And I'm super happy with what they've been doing with the song looks. They've really... Um, been jamming it out more and more um, since, oh, I can't remember that show now off the top of my head uh, with the first version of, uh, you know, the jammed out looks, but it was definitely later in the summer. So it hasn't been very long that they've been jamming that out. And it's just interesting to see how far that one has come and, you know, how much more that's going to grow and what they're going to sandwich in between there and everything else, you know, as time goes on. Um, Mad Dog's Filthy Little Secret and Jeff Coffin come out one more time um, to cover Fat Man in the Bathtub by Little Feet, a debut. And this one was very cool and such a great cover for them. The energy when they were all playing was just so much fun. And Coffin, of course, just adds so much to anything that he's playing with them. And, you know, Mad Dog, too. I mean, having the horns with them and the saxophone with them is always a good choice 
This coming to an end with a dream sequence kind of a feel before dancing right into Kama later, also with all of the horns. Another great addition to this song. Leaving it to levitate for a minute and then taking it into It's About That Time by Miles Davis to close out the second set. This one has been covered a total of 73 times. Last time was at the Brooklyn Bowl in Las Vegas, Nevada on March 17th, 2017. And that was actually the last time that Umphreys has played in Las Vegas. I know that there's some people that have been itching to get them back there. So I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's going to be happening in 2019 but you just you never know all right so that brings us to the final set of the weekend this one opens with a very interstellar hurt bird bath that gets very dark and ominous slinky kind of and eerie a little over eight minutes in and continues to slink along, kind of creep around for a little bit, gaining more aggression before just exploding with full on rage about nine and a half in and just continues to morph and grow, almost like spreading its destruction all around. I was feeling like this was just a really great release for anyone that felt they had a lot of shit in 2018 that they just needed to get rid of and start 2019 fresh. Just rage all of it out of you, the good, the bad, the ugly, whatever that year had brought for you. I felt like that was them giving us that moment to just release all of that and just get it all out. Um, I was wondering if they were going to jam this one out long enough um, to make this one the tune that went into 2019, but it was not. Attachments, not going to say it again about this song because I know I probably say it at least every episode and I always say it to my husband. Um, But yeah, I used to hate that song and now I love it because that's what Umphreys does to you. Um, What they've done to this song in 2018, I'm sure you know all about the August 18th uh, St. Augustine show with that Attachments. Still, even though they played this one in New Year's and it was still really sick, I think that the one from August is still the the best one. Um, This, I'm super grateful that they took this one into New Year's. I think it's a great tune all around for that. You know, the, the lyrics of it have a really great meaning. And it is more than ready to handle going into the countdown. It's certainly matured enough this year that it could absolutely handle it. And the jam at the end of this one really begins a little over six and a half minutes in, really using the last minutes of 2018 to see what else that song can accomplish this year. A dance party right out of the gate, Mad Dog's Filthy Little Secret and Jeff Coffin sneaking out during this jam adding their own flavor, gearing up to take this train right into 2019, building up to the excitement to head into the countdown. And I will tell you, if you have never done a New Year's show anyways, like at all, or especially an Umphreys show on New Year's, you need to do it. Like, you need to do it. It needs to be something that you do in your life. The countdown, all the excitement right at that moment, the balloons, the confetti, you know, all the people just hugging and loving. I mean, it's just the most amazing experience ever. And I'm still getting goosebumps talking about it. And I totally got teary eyed while they were playing all Lang Syne and just, you know, loving all of it and being there with all of my friends and just ringing in the ear in this beautiful moment. I have zero shame about crying at a show because your emotions are just there. You're just feeling it. And I definitely cried twice during this run because it was just absolutely amazing. (laughs) And I don't even care. I love this fucking band so much. And I love all the people that are, you know, around it and, you know, the community and everything. So yeah. (laughs) Um, Resolution being the first song played in 2019, obviously for, you know, reasons. Um, 
sorry, sweet uplifting jam that begins to take shape only a little over two minutes and continues to soar along, inspiring everyone and giving everybody all the feel good New Year's vibes. Having the horns added in here too was just beautiful. Stomping right back into resolution at five and a half in and then taking this jam all sorts of funky, slowly beginning to tease going back into in the kitchen about nine and a half minutes in the conclusion of that tune that was played during the encore of night one back on the 28th does come back slowly at first with the snow beginning to fall and then coming back in full force to finish up that tune. Kula coming up next. This song that I again just like to stand there and watch, especially in the beginning. And then when it just explodes all over and just rages the fuck out, there's just really no way to describe this tune adequately. This one also features the Carol of Bells jam that showed up in that in the kitchen on night one. And I am honestly officially obsessed with them playing this. I would love to hear them just play that, you know, just in its entirety. There's no doubt that it would be amazing. This incredible set three closes out with the debut of the cover, What You Need by In Excess. Again with the horns. Bayless reminding us before they go into that, that Umphreys might not give us what we want, but they will certainly give us what we need. And honestly, he's pretty fucking spot on about that. And I totally felt that way about all of the shows during this run, but especially my 50th show Saturday night. I had no idea what I would have even asked for a request, and that's probably part of the reason why I didn't, because I didn't want to just ask for something for the sake of asking. I, so I didn't, and I'm super glad that I didn't because they 100% gave me exactly what I needed that night. The encore starts with a horn band challenge, as Bela says. Um, Mad Dog's Filthy Little Secret and Jeff Coffin appear in the upper balcony Joel side and challenge Umphreys to a jam off, which was very, very cool. Where we were sitting for uh, New Year's was very close to where this was going on. So it was awesome to have such a very cool view of it. So the challenge was that the horns would play something and then Umphreys would play something to one-up them. This challenge featured In the Mood by Glenn Miller, The Ocean by Led Zeppelin, Voodoo Child by Hendrix, So Fresh, So Clean by Outkast, Donna Lee by Charlie Parker, and Unskinny Bop by Poison. It was very, very cool. And... Obviously, Umphreys, you know, won, won the jam. The, uh, the horns eventually uh, wove their white flag of surrender, and Umphreys wins. So, Bayless mentions that they are going to go over on time and plan to pay a fine because they love us so much. And, of course, everyone is super excited about that. Haji dedicated to Robbie's wife, who was celebrating her birthday that evening. A wonderful and perfect song for all of the feelings and love that we were all feeling about the weekend as a whole, the band, the shows, the place, the people, you know, New Year's, just all of it. The very end of this with Jake is totally another part of the weekend that I will never forget him just going to town on that guitar you will know what I mean when you hear this and hear the end of it if you haven't listened to it already they close out everything with a cover of Detroit Rock City by Kiss one more time bringing out Mad Dog and his filthy little secret with Jeff Coffin the only song from Kiss honestly that I can get behind I'm not a Kiss fan at all but this one I do like and I always thought that this would be really awesome to hear them cover, and it most certainly was. They have done this one other time back in 2012 on February 18th at the Fillmore in Detroit. 
Also, bringing out the smoke machine again, giving that arena rock to everybody one more time. So, yeah, there it is, guys, my review of the New Year's Eve run. Thank you so much for sticking around and listening to all of this. If you have, you're so amazing. Thank you so much for all of your support and taking the time for me to listen to me talk about Umphreys every week. I'm so grateful to be able to do this and have this outlet to talk about something that I love so, so much. I will admit that bringing this episode and doing this review for you guys was quite a project, you know, listening back to everything and taking notes, but I loved every second of it. It was so awesome to relive it and give all of you guys you know, my thoughts and ideas. It's definitely hard to pick a favorite night of the run, but my, my order is night two, night four, night one, night three. I know a lot of people are loving night three too. And obviously it had some high points, slacker, uh, you know, the 2018 return of made to measure, the utopian. I mean, there's definitely, you know, like none of the nights suck at all. Like you can't say that at all. All of it was absolutely amazing. Um, but for me, I just felt like the flow of night two was much better. Um, of course, trying to take out the consideration of them playing band on the run and it being my 50th show, of course. Um, but I just feel that night two, the flow was much better. Um, but like I said, it's, you know, none of the shows were lacking by any means. They absolutely killed it every single solitary night. Um, but if I had to put my shows in order, that's exactly how I would do it. So thank you again so much for joining me for this episode. There are a ton of links in the show notes for you guys to nerd out on. So definitely check them all out. Do yourself a favor and listen to this run. And I will see you guys around these parts next week. Much obliged.